In this beginner tutorial, we'll cover what machine learning and deep learning are, how you can apply them, and when you should use one technique over the other. To start with, machine learning and deep learning are both forms of artificial intelligence. And believe it or not, AI arose in the 1950s and 60s in order to simulate human decisions and judgment. Here's a screenshot from a very early AI called Eliza. And Eliza tried to simulate a therapist. So it would have a chat with you where you could ask it questions and it could ask you questions. And AI is all about building programs that can make decisions like a human. You'll hear a lot of hype about AI, but it's really just code and data. There's no magic involved. And today I'll show you under the hood how some AI algorithms work. So I wrote some code here that loads a pre-trained deep learning model by an organization called Big Science. And then it asks the AI to explain what AI is. And here's the output of this code. It's an explanation of AI. And the explanation is that AI is just a computer program that processes data and makes decisions. So let's learn a little bit more about how humans make decisions and about how we teach machines to do the same thing. Let's say we wanted to predict tomorrow's temperature. We might look outside and make a very simple rule. We might decide that tomorrow's temperature is going to be the exact same as today's temperature. It's not a very complicated rule, but it actually works decently well. And let's see how well it works. We're going to write a little bit of code. So we'll import a Python library called pandas that helps us work with data. And then we'll load in a data set of weather observations. So these observations are from November 20th, 2022 to November 26th. So each row here is one day's worth of data. The T max column is the maximum temperature that day. And the prediction column is our prediction for tomorrow's temperature. And as you can see, it's the exact same as the Tmax column because we're just predicting that tomorrow's temperature will be the same as today's temperature. All right, once we make predictions, we wanna be able to see how good they are. And to do that, we can calculate the error of our predictions. And we're gonna calculate error by just subtracting the actual value, so tomorrow's actual temperature, from our predictions. So what we'll do is I'll read in another set of data that has tomorrow's temperature. So I didn't explain this earlier, but I'm using the pandas read CSV function, which reads in a CSV file, which is basically just like a sheet in a spreadsheet. And it lets us use that data in Python. Then I'm going to calculate a column called error. And this column we get by subtracting our predicted temperature from tomorrow's temperature. So to tomorrow's temperature is in this column Tmax tomorrow. And we take the absolute value, which just removes any negative signs. So it gives us the difference, but just the absolute difference. And then we can take a look at our observations data, including this error column. Okay, so we now have four columns, the same Tmax and prediction column we had before but we also have tomorrow's temperature in a column. And here's the error between our predictions and tomorrow's temperature. So in some cases, the error is pretty small. We're just off by one degree Fahrenheit, but some of our predictions are pretty far off. All right. It's hard to just look at a bunch of different error numbers, like in the table we just saw, and actually figure out how good the algorithm is. So usually what we do is we turn that into a single error metric. In this case, we'll just take the average of all of the errors, and that's called mean absolute error. So we take the error column from our observations data, and we just take the mean of that column, which is just the average of that column, which gives us 3.28. So that's our average error across all of our data. And it just makes it easy to evaluate how good or bad our technique for prediction was. That's what this error metric is doing, telling us how good or bad our prediction was. So on average, 
our prediction is 3.28 degrees away from the actual temperature. And usually we want this error to be as low as possible, right? We want to make a really good prediction. So we want to try to shrink this error. And to do that, we can use a technique called expert systems. And expert systems were very, very popular in the 1980s. They were part of a big AI wave then. And in expert systems, computers run human-generated rules to make predictions. So for example, we might, we might make two rules. So we might say tomorrow's temperature is going to be the average of the temperature over the past five days. And we might say, if today is more than five degrees warmer than yesterday, add two to tomorrow's temperature. So these two rules help us make a prediction. And then we can tell a computer to actually evaluate these rules to make predictions. So I'll write a little bit of code that will do this. So I'm going to read in into a pandas data frame this CSV file, expert error.csv, where I've already applied these rules and calculated the error. And then just like before, we're going to take the mean of the error column. So first, let's see what this data looks like. Take this off. So we can see that we have same table as before with the same error column, but some of the error values are now different. So let's add back in our code to calculate the error. And we can see our error with this technique is 3.05. So on average, we're within 3.05 degrees of the actual temperature. All right, so that's expert systems. Now we can move on to actually thinking about machine learning. So that's the next evolution of AI from expert systems to machine learning in the 1990s and 2000s. So the idea behind machine learning is that instead of making the rules ourselves, instead of having a human make the rules, an algorithm automatically generates the rules. So this makes it a lot easier to use than expert systems, right? Because in expert systems, you may have to come up with hundreds or thousands of rules, but machine learning automates all of that. And this is called supervised machine learning. And supervised machine learning is when you give the algorithm some data and something to predict, and it learns the rules for how to predict it. There's also unsupervised machine learning, which I'm not gonna cover in this video, but unsupervised machine learning is where you give the algorithm some data and it finds patterns in your data. But we're gonna focus on supervised machine learning. And here's an example of a supervised machine learning algorithm called a decision tree. So let's say we work at a theater and we're deciding whether or not to let someone in to see an R-rated movie. And an R-rated movie is a movie that you have to be 17 years old to see in the US. You also need the money or a ticket. So you can imagine a pretty straightforward decision tree here. So we check if the person we wanna let in is under 17, if they are, we move to the left and we check if they're with an adult. If they are with an adult, we let them in. If they're not, we don't let them watch the movie. Meanwhile, if they're over 17, we then check if they have enough money to get into the movie. The movie costs $20 to watch. If they don't have $20, we don't let them see the movie. If they do have $20, we let them see the movie. So a decision tree algorithm, which is a form of a machine learning algorithm, will automatically learn all of these rules and the whole tree, which is very cool. I'm gonna focus on a different machine learning algorithm called linear regression. And in linear regression, we learn a linear relationship between predictors X and targets Y. Usually one target, but you can also have multiple targets. So the equation for linear regression is Y equals MX plus B. So Y is what you're trying to predict, so tomorrow's temperature. X is the data you're passing in. So in this case, today's temperature. And M is what you multiply X by, and then you add B. So M is typically called a slope, and B is typically called a Y-intercept, if you're familiar with linear regression. The model will learn M and B automatically using an equation or gradient descent. So let's take a quick look at what it means for two variables to have a linear relationship. So I'm going to load in a weather data set, and I'll show you this data set. This has data from 1970 all the way through to 2022. So this model is able to learn over a very large data set. 
And then what we can do is we can actually make a quick plot of this data. You'll notice there's a few columns here. So there's the Tmax, which is the maximum temperature in a certain day. There's Tmin, the minimum temperature in that day. There's rain, so the amount of rain that fell. And then there's tomorrow's temperature. So let's plot two of these columns against each other. We're going to make a scatter plot of the maximum temperature today against the maximum temperature tomorrow. So let's go ahead and plot that. I'll actually make this a little smaller so you can see it. And you can see here that when we make this scatter plot, the shape of the data kind of looks like a line, right? You can imagine drawing a line through the center of that data that indicates a linear relationship between today's temperature and tomorrow's. So that relationship might be, hey, if you multiply today's temperature by 1.01, .01, and then add some constant, like two or three, that gives you tomorrow's temperature. But the model will automatically learn what you multiply today's temperature by and what you add. All right, so let's go see how that works. So we're gonna actually use a Python library called scikit-learn to train a linear regression model. So we first import the linear regression class, and then we create our linear regression instance of the class. Then what we're gonna do is split up our weather data to get a training set. So we're gonna train our algorithm on any weather observations from before November 20th, 2022. And then we're gonna go ahead and fit the model. So we're basically saying, use today's temperature, the Tmax column, to predict tomorrow's temperature, Tmax tomorrow. So we can run that, and the model has actually been fit. So what we can do once the model has been fit is take a look at some of our parameters. So let's take a look here. So what we can say is take our linear regression instance and say lr.coef. And this actually shows us the value of m. So you'll remember from the previous slide, y equals mx plus b. So M is what we multiply today's temperature by to get tomorrow's temperature. So we're actually multiplying by 0.81. And then we can check out the intercept also. And the intercept is what we add to the multiplied temperature to get tomorrow's temperature. So we're basically saying, take today's temperature. So if today's temperature is 80, we multiply by the coefficient, and then we add the intercept. And this gives us tomorrow's temperature or the predicted temperature from this model for tomorrow. All right, so now that we have the coefficients, we can actually evaluate how well this model works. So we really want to evaluate a model on different data from what we train it on. This ensures that the model is building general rules that apply to all data. So imagine that you're taking a test and it's an open book test and you haven't studied at all, you don't know anything you still might pass the test just because it's open book. You can read exactly the thing in your book that tells you the answer. But if you had got a closed book test, then you wouldn't know the answer because you didn't actually learn anything. So that's exactly why we evaluate the model on different data from what we train it on. We don't want it to have learned all the answers just because it's already seen the data. All right. So let's make some predictions. And then from those predictions, we can calculate our error. So we first create a test set, which is what we're going to make predictions on and use to evaluate our model. And this is all of the data in our weather data set after November 20th, 2022. Then we can use the linear regression predict method and pass in our test temperatures to get predictions. And let's take a look at these predictions. So these are predicted tomorrow temperatures for each day. So November 20th, 21st, 22nd, et cetera. And once we have these, we can actually calculate our mean absolute error. So we see we've reduced it to 2.92. From the expert model, it was 3.05. So by automatically learning some rules, we have improved our error. All right. Now, machine learning models can also use multiple predictors. So for linear regression, that equation looks like this. 
we just have multiple M values and still a single B value. So let's see what that actually looks like. So if you'll remember, before we had that rain column, and we can use that to add in some information for our algorithm. So we can fit our linear regression model, not just on the maximum temperature, but on the maximum temperature and the amount of rain that fell. And we'll use both of those predictors to predict tomorrow's temperature. So let's go ahead and fit that. And once we fit it, we'll take a look at this COEF. So you now see we have two coefficients. So this is our coefficient for Tmax. So we multiply today's maximum temperature by 0.81 to get tomorrow's maximum temperature. And you can see the coefficient for rain is negative 1.53. So that means, basically what this means is if it rained today, our model thinks that it's going to be cooler tomorrow, which makes sense, right? If it rains one day, usually it's cooler the next day. So that's what this negative coefficient means. We're gonna multiply the amount of rain that fell by this amount and add it into our equation. And we can also take a look at our intercept, which is B. That's going to be 12. Okay, so we can use this linear regression model to create predictions. So similarly to what we did before, we'll call the predict method, but this time we'll pass in Tmax and rain. And then we can calculate our mean absolute error. All right, 2.89. So let's go back to the previous screen, 2.92. So we can see we did a little bit better here by adding in an extra predictor, rain. All right, so generally the best way to reduce error in a machine learning model is to either give the model more data, so more rows of data, more observations, or give the model better features to make predictions with. So in this case, we can actually add some extra columns that tell the model more about how the data is organized. And this is called feature engineering. We're not, we're not going out and gathering more data, but we're actually giving the algorithm a better view into the data we have. So for example, we could add a column that shows the average temperature in the last seven days. So not just today's temperature, but the average over the past week. We can also give the algorithm the ratio between today's temperature and the average temperature. And the model can use these two columns to make better predictions. Now, eventually all algorithms will hit a point where error can't be reduced anymore. So you can't just keep feature engineering and keep getting better and better performance. There is a point where you have to either add more data, switch to a better model, or just accept that you can't actually model it any better. All right, so let's see how this is going to look if we do a little bit of feature engineering. So we'll create our average temperature column so this is going to be the maximum temperature, the rolling average of the maximum temperature over the past seven days. Then we'll add in a temp ratio column, which is the ratio between today's temperature and the average temperature over the last seven days. And we're gonna remove any rows that are missing. Okay, let's take a look at what this looks like. All right, this table is a little hard to see down there but you can see that we added in these two columns. So average temp is the average temperature over the last week, and then temp ratio is the ratio between today's temperature and the average. I did this drop NA just to remove some missing rows at the beginning. If you're familiar with pandas, you'll, you'll know what that did. Okay, now what we can do is we can take a look at our training data set again. So our training data set is all of our data up until November 20th, 2022. And then we can go ahead and fit our model again, but this time we're adding in these two extra columns, these extra predictors. Okay, so we'll go ahead and fit that. Okay, and then uh, let's continue. Once we fit the model, we can again create our test set, which is everything from November 20th, 2022 onwards. We can generate predictions similar to what we did before. We're passing in these two extra columns. And we can again check out our mean absolute error. And we can see it's down to 2.69, which is a pretty big improvement from our last model. So feature engineering has helped us actually really reduce our error. 
All right. Now let's move on to deep learning. So machine learning automatically makes rules for predictions using features. So unlike an expert system, machine learning automates creating the rules. Now, if we want to reduce error with machine learning, we usually have to do feature engineering to add better and better features. The cool thing about deep learning is it automatically makes the features and the rules. So you don't need to do feature engineering because the deep learning algorithm will automatically do the feature engineering for you. And how it works is you input some data and the neural network has hidden layers. Deep learning models are also called neural networks. So those two are interchangeable terms. The neural network has what are called hidden layers and your data flows through these hidden layers. And in the hidden layers, the model generates new features. And these new features look a lot like the feature engineering we just did. So they can be ratios between columns, rolling averages, all kinds of, all kinds of different things you can create out of these hidden layers. Okay. So that is at a high level, how a neural network works. Let's dive a little bit deeper and take a closer look. Deep learning repeatedly applies linear and nonlinear functions to generate a prediction. So here's an example of a network y equals R E L U W one B plus W one X plus B one. So you might notice that this looks a lot like our, our earlier linear regression model, and it does actually have a lot to do with linear regression. This is basically applying a linear transformation to our X values, uh, our input data. And it's adding again, a, something similar to a Y intercept, but this is called a bias in deep learning. And this is called a weight or a set of weights. And RELU, ReLU is a nonlinear activation function that we apply on top of our linear transformation. And neural networks are really just a series of nonlinear transformations and linear transformation. So here's an example of a two hidden layer network. So this is hidden layer one, and that's the inside. And then outside, we again do another linear transformation and another nonlinear transformation. So that's the two layer network right there. So let's take a deeper look at how this works. You can see at the very bottom here, that's an example of a neuron in, in deep learning. And you can see that data flows into the neuron and the neuron applies an activation function and then spits out a value, which if it happens at the end of the network is a prediction. If it happens in the inside of the network is a value for the next hidden layer. All right. And we use an algorithm called gradient descent to automatically find the correct values for all of the W's and B's, all of the weights and biases. Okay. So let's actually do a little code example of a deep neural network. So this, this code, I'm not going to get into a ton of depth, but all this is doing is loading in the same training and test data we saw before and splitting it up. So train X will be our predictors and train Y is what we're trying to predict. Same with test, test X and test Y. So let's go ahead and run this. And this is the initial configuration for our neural network. And neural networks take a decent amount of configuration to actually get them to run properly. They're a little bit finicky. So we have to configure a learning rate and a learning rate essentially defines how quickly the network gets the correct weights and biases. If you set it too high, the network will change the weights and biases too fast and never actually get the correct ones because it actually changes so fast that it misses the correct values. If you set it too low, the network will move towards the correct values very, very slowly, and it'll just take forever to run. So it does take some trial and error to set the correct learning rate. This layer configuration configures the layers of our neural network. So our neural network has this input data, which is just the number of columns in our train X data. The next layer will actually generate 20 different features for each of our rows in our X data. Then the next layer will generate 10 features. So it'll actually turn those 20 features into 10 by combining them and summarizing them. 
And then it'll summarize those 10 features into one feature, which is our prediction. So that's, that's kind of the general configuration of our network. And then this line just sets up the layers correctly. And we can actually take a look at our first layer of our network here. And we can see it's just a bunch of numbers. So these correspond to our W and our B values, our weights and our biases, which is what the network is learning. Okay. Now we can actually use this network to make predictions. So in deep learning, you usually want to feed the same piece of data into the network multiple times. So it has multiple chances to actually learn from the data. So what this outer loop does is it's just going to loop five times. So we're going to feed each piece of data into our network five times. This loop loops over every piece of our data and feeds it into the network. All right. And then the call here, this call is a little bit complicated. I should take that up. What this does is it basically goes through each row in our data. It sends that row of data into our neural network. The neural network makes predictions. Then it figures out if those predictions were correct or incorrect. So it makes predictions using this. That's our train X. Then it figures out if they're correct or not using train Y. And if they are very incorrect, then it goes back and it changes its weights a lot. If they're a little bit incorrect, it goes back and it changes its weights a little. And over time, its weights and its biases will be tuned to actually make correct predictions. So let's go ahead and run this code. Okay, so our network has been trained. And once we train it, we actually want to make predictions. So to make predictions, our network will, will basically follow these steps. It'll take in our, our data. It'll multiply it by W1, so that first set of weights. It'll add the first set of biases. Then it'll apply our nonlinear activation function. Then it'll do the same thing with our second set of weights and biases. Then it'll, it'll apply the nonlinear function again. Then it'll multiply by our third set of weights and add in our third set of biases. And it will not apply the nonlinear activation because this last layer is what spits out our prediction. So this describes, this is layer one of the network, layer two, layer three. All right, and let's see how good the predictions our network makes are. So the first thing we'll do is we will run our net in forward mode, which does exactly these things, to generate predictions across our test set. And then we will measure our error. So our error here is 2.88. It is about the same, a little bit worse than our latest machine learning algorithm. And I'll talk a little bit later about why that happens and when to use machine learning and when to use deep learning. Okay, so in summary, machine learning and deep learning both automatically learn prediction rules. Machine learning requires a lot of feature engineering at times, but deep learning automatically engineers features. That doesn't mean you don't need to clean your data, make sure you have the right columns. It just means you may not need to actually create new features just for the algorithm. Machine learning is usually better for tabular data, which is the type of data we just worked with. So it's data that's like an Excel sheet, like a table. Machine learning is usually better there because that data is already structured. So the algorithm doesn't have to learn the structure of the data. Deep learning is really good for times when you have to learn the structure of the data. Like if the data is just free text or images, like you've seen with algorithms like stable diffusion or GPT, deep learning can automatically learn the structure of that data and generate a good response. In general, deep learning needs a lot more data, time, and parameter optimization than machine learning. It's a lot more finicky to get it to work, but when it does work, the results are incredible. And it's usually a little bit harder to understand why a model is making a prediction with deep learning. Deep learning models are sometimes referred to as black box models because data goes in. It's not easy to tell what happened inside to cause a certain prediction and a prediction comes out. Whereas with something like linear regression, we saw that we can easily look at the coefficients and understand what they mean. 
So there, it, this is an active area of research and there is a lot of work trying to make deep learning models more interpretable and explainable, but it's not always easy to tell how or why a deep learning model made a certain decision. So at a high level, this is the difference and when to use one or when to use the other. There's a lot of special cases. The field is moving fast. Things may change. Sometimes the best way to tell the right technique is honestly to try both and see what works given your error metric. As long as you have a strong error metric and you're able to measure it effectively, you can actually tell which one is better for your specific data. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed this walkthrough of deep learning and machine learning. And if you want to learn more, please check out our DataQuest courses on both. We just launched a lot of new machine learning and deep learning courses.